recording. Okay. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody back to um, the uh, back to the cell study course um, that we've been doing for the last 25, 26 so or so weeks. Um, the purpose of this course is to um, uh, take an opportunity to go through the Getty at our um, uh, uh, be beginning um, entry level at Emma and to take a look at the Getty and the uh, the contents of it in a way that we might not get to do if we're just uh, showing up to class and training on the floor because sometimes there is a significant difference between what we uh, consume of Fiore on the floor of the cell and what is in the manuscript because there's a lot of work and digestion that needs to be done often in order to bring it to you on the floor. Um, uh, we are at the mounted section, finally, the last section of Fiore today, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, we're going to get to some really cool and, and neat stuff. Um, the last number of weeks, uh, both Cal and I have been the main voices on this Monday night, um, and we're uh, very happy to you know, help take you guys through the material. But it is important that you know that um, we don't want you to think something is so just because we said it. Um, we're all engaged in a scholarly enterprise, and um, so what we want is we want evidence, and we want specifically you to be convinced by the same evidence that convinces us. And in that way, uh, if you do the same, then we're all engaged in this scholarly enterprise together, and isn't that great? Um, if you have any questions, of course, at any time, please do s say so, and we'll deal with them. And um, yeah, it'll be it'll be great. Um, so, does anybody have any questions or things they want to bring up uh, from the last session that they didn't get a chance to? No. Okay. Uh, cool. So, as you might notice, um, the media, the Emma Wiki is having an issue right now. I don't know of what kind. I don't actually own the server. So it is down right now, so we're not going to use it. Um, we're going to use a local copy of uh, one of the versions of um, the Getty that I, I have. I think I, 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 um, I put this one together with the help of a, a little Anthony. So uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, so we're, we're all good. Um, and uh, without further ado, we might as well start. So the mounted section. We are dealing, uh, dealing with the mounted section today. Um, the mounted section of Fiore begins where folio 41 uh, R and uh, continues to the end of the book. It comprises two parts. Uh, it's comprised of two main parts. Um, one is of a combat uh, on horseback against someone on horseback. And then the second part is combat on foot against uh, opponents on horseback. So th that seems to be broadly speaking how the section uh, divides. So we're going to start with the beginning and we're going to start with combat um, combat on, ho on horseback against whew, I went way too far. Combat on horseback against uh, an opponent on horseback. Why is it 41R I said, right? There we go. Perfect. Uh, okay. So um, let's begin. So the, the way we start um, all the all the sections when we're dealing with something new is we draw a border or context around it so that we can actually get into it and um, do something useful. So we're going to do the same with the mounted section today, and we'll try and keep it as um, efficient as possible. So what we're in store for here with the mounted section is in store for um, on the one hand, things that are um, mostly uh, totally unknown to the audience here, with uh, a few notable exceptions. Um, Bruce uh, uh, has a horse. Is that is that true, uh, Bruce? You, you you currently own one. Uh, yes, I currently yeah. own a horse. Yeah. I have trained mm -hmm. that horse and a couple mm -hmm. of others, mm -hmm. and I have I ride him every week. Maybe awesome sometimes two three times awesome. and this past couple of years i have taken back gone back to playing with a lance awesome. or a sword from the saddle 
<clears throat> awesome. So so we have uh, we have a range of exper uh, experience with um, the equestrian arts here in the chat. Uh, Kel has ridden a number of times in his life, but he is uh, um, he is no um, no professed expert. Please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Kel. That's right. And That's myself, right. I've ridden three times in my life, I think, and been terrified every one of them because horses are big and uh, they have minds of their own. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, uh, so with that being said, um, unlike in some of the previous sections where um, uh, Akel and I will have either a significant or partial experience with the particular weapon set that we're talking about, um, n neither of us are experts, are, are equestrian experts here. So as always... You have to take what we offer with a grain of salt, follow our arguments, see if you're convinced, et cetera, et cetera. But especially, of course, here. And it's important to note, you know, the, the challenge that we have when we're dealing with this material. Right. Uh, and that'll become more obvious going forward. So, all right. Mounted, mounted combat. So we've been following this theme so far in the in the book, uh, in the Getty specifically, where it seems like there is an increase in difficulty in complexity as the book goes on we start the book unarmed wrestling and we before we got to the mounted section we had armored combat in with the spear so you know <laughs> unarmed wrestling we had no encumbrance whatsoever and we had immediate instantaneous tactile sensation of our enemy all the way to combat with a spear in armor, where not only do are we encased in a significant amount of armor with all of the important skills that we would require to, to even be there in armor, but we're also using a weapon that is itself extremely variable in our own grip. So we have we, we've seen this kind of sliding scale of difficulty with in the manuscripts. Not a hard and fast rule, but it certainly seems to have been presented that way um, in uh, in Fiore. And so, um, curiously, we end with the mounted section. And so, uh, the mounted section, mo many of the figures are in armor. Um, I'm not sure there's a consensus that it's intended to be, you know, mounted combat in armor exclusively or not. I think the jury's out on that one. Um, but there are obviously figures uh, in armor. But of course, the main fixture of the mounted section is the horse. And um, long story short, in order to begin the mounted section, one needs to have the same comfort with a horse as one does with their own feet. Uh, Akel and I both agree that effectively um, what the mounted section does here um, in comparison to the other sections is it presents a martial problem where your feet are not your own. So when our feet were our own, we not only had to be intimately comfortable with our own feet, but also learn how to apply our feet in a martial context, right? Because just because someone's walked and ran for their whole life doesn't mean that they know how to have good footwork. In martial arts right they martially apply their own um, intimate knowledge of their of their own body right so too with horsemanship where you know you're practicing your basic skills and foundations your whole life um, in in this particular cultural context right every everything about a horse and then you're applying those skills to a martial context as well so that's a whole uh, that, that's a that's a huge lifetime of skill and mastery that um, many of us just don't have access to and likely never will which is unfortunate um, partly due to cost partly you know tons of things but this is what we're dealing with here in the mounted section first and foremost and this is what makes the mounted section um, uh, largely unapproachable to most of us right we can't even begin to understand it very well um, because we just lack the simple equestrian uh, expertise but of course um, it is what it is we're gonna we're gonna read it anyway so there's that element of it but the other element of it is the familiar 
And the familiar is that, you know, we're at the end of the book. We're at the end of, of Fury's treatment of, um, of martial arts. And uh, a lot of what we're going to see in the mounted section, martially speaking, is going to be kind of... Uh, it's going to be familiar and per perhaps obvious to us if we're following the themes of what Fiori is presenting, right? Some of the things will be unique and interesting, like the, you know, being able to throw a horse by his collar, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of cool. Some really interesting, unique plays. But um, a lot of the stuff we're going to see in the mounted section is going to fit with our general understanding of how weapons work, how timing works, how angles work, etc etc right so we're going to see both the familiar and the unfamiliar uh do you want to add anything to that kel no let's get on with it all righty so here we have the first play <clears throat> we have 41 r a and b and is that yeah here we go um so who's first on our list alex would you like to read our first play Carry my lance and post a Didentrici Garos, that means I have good armor. If my lance is shorter than my opponent's and I count on beating his lance aside, either obliquely or upward, I will end up with an arm's length of my lance crossing an arm's length of his. Then my lance will glide all the way to his body, while his weapon will end up harmlessly away from me. This is exactly what I will do. Thank you very much. And then it's got a little note. The text goes with the king on this side. And, and the text is on the wrong side. <laughs> so the text is uh, goes with this king. Okay, so what does he say? He says, if he has, if I have a short lance, he's going to lie the lance across the horse, across the horse's head on his left side. So you can't really, it's, it's hard to see the lance, um, but uh, it's supposed to be lying across his face to the left side of the horse. And he's just going to exchange the point. And we all know about exchange of point, right? And that's pretty much it. Um, we talked about in spear of um, where we typically cross. And with the spear, um, I think Kel and I both agreed that we typically are going to seek an engagement on the first third of the spear uh, if we can help it. Although, of course, there's always exceptions. Um, and that's likely also the case here, right? A distance equals time, et cetera, et cetera. The engagement is probably going to be on the first third of the of the lance. Uh, Aaron? Yes, Bruce. So uh, <clears throat> you, his lance, you can see the tip of it on, under the arm. Yeah. This is the couch. They're both in couched position. Mm -hmm. It's what he's going to have to do is with exquisite sense of timing, mm -hmm. he is going to carry his lance pointed downwards while his opponent is coming at him, aiming at him. Mm -hmm. and it's going to require an exquisitely fine sense of timing to raise his lance up and knock his opponent's lance, or just, you, you know, what did you call it? Not parry, but just guide it off the to the king's right-hand side. Mm -hmm so that his opponent's lance will miss him to the exchange of point. But it, re it does require an exquisitely fine sense of timing and a lot of practice. Of that, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I can't, I can't imagine. Uh, um, yeah. I have a quick question also. Mm -hmm. uh, what what relevance does uh, your lance being relatively shorter? It seems like you'd kind of want to do an exchange of point regardless of the relative lengths of the lances. So that's a great question, Alex. Um so I'll uh, I'll take a stab at this one, and then Kel, you can give give your view. So the one of the main problems we see at the beginning of this section here is the problem of dealing with another mounted person when your uh, lance is shorter than his. Um, and the 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 problem is that if your lance is shorter, then your horse is at risk. And and so if you try and go lance on lance, he can just drop his lance and hit your horse before you can even touch him. So, uh, and he, and he can also set your lance aside, right? And he, 
right? It's because his lance is longer than yours. So by holding it low until the last moment, you also make it impossible to knock us away, but you also kind of keep your horse protected until the last moment. And you're also provoking him to strike you on the on the open line. And if he takes it, then you can attempt this exchange of point. That's what I would su uh, suggest. Uh, well, as an observation, your lance would have to be extremely short. <clears throat> Even an eight foot long uh, uh, or less than a two meter lance, which is the one I use, mm. which is relatively small. I've seen up to three meters long. But even a lance that is only uh, two meters long and some of it is still stuck up under my shoulder will still reach beyond the head of my horse. So my lance can always catch his lance before his lance can hit my horse's head. If he's going to do that. He can. I didn't say successfully, but... Yeah, well, obviously, if your lens is, is, is so short that it doesn't go past your horse's head, then this won't work. <laughs> but, yeah. And you, yeah. Really, you really shouldn't be bothering with a tool like that. Yeah, that would be... Going toe-to-toe -to -toe against a long lanced opponent would be strange in that in that context, yeah. Your horse is going to get gonna get hit. Um, but could you do this with a longer lance, Alex? Uh, I would have to try it, perhaps. Maybe it, there's... A sweet spot where the lance is not too long and not too short, um, but fear mm. specifies a shorter lance. I don't, I don't see any problem with that. Mm. I mean, certainly the the jousting, the modern jousting community uh, have match lances, but they uh, frequently have what they call parries, which they don't like because it's a it's a null, you know, it's a draw, it's a, a null point. Uh, although historically there was not a real problem with that, uh, <clears throat> you'd still win a check. You just didn't get any any uh, points on your check. Anyway, this this business is specifically for this is a challenge because you want to make sure the guy with the longer lance is provoked. So the business of provocation, I think, is more critical here because if you can convince yeah. him to make the blow that you're already mentally prepared for, you have a much better chance of yeah. making your cover from below, uh, whether it sets him off mm -hmm. way to the right or, or, or up is not really relevant because you're going to go down his lance because as it go down towards him, the lance goes towards the center of him and he's, as he has it couched. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 the part, whole part of this play is, is here's a way to make sure someone does what you want them to do uh, and that you can deal with it. Uh, whereas if you try to outreach him, he, he's going to hit you first yeah. and ruin your aim. Right? You're not yeah. going to be able to hit the target. So I think it's really about the provocation. So yeah. from if, if your lance is the same, you could do this, but then you also could do a bunch of other stuff that you can with a shorter lance. Um, yeah, you, you have some limitations. Mm -hmm. If your lance is the same size as his, you could try uh, to make a, a, a cover here. But um, there, as you say, there, there are other options. Whereas if your lance is shorter, your options are quite limited. Mm -hmm. Hence the provocation. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and we're going to see that um, there's a lot about this situation here. Um, a lot about this is, at least in, in the way that Fiori is going to show it with the lance, uh, a lot about it has to do with the horse, the vulnerability of the, of the animal. Um, not necessarily, you know, uh, lance versus lance, uh, engaging and pairing and so forth. Um, okay, and speak of the devil, um, the next play, which is 41R, C, and D. Um, BD, would you like to read this one for us? This is the counter to the previous play of the lance, applying to when two opponents run against each other, or run against one another with sharpened irons, and the two lances are one shorter than the other. The one with the shorter lance carries his weapon low, intended to be the arrow, 
The other should similarly hold his lance low, so as to prevent his opponent from beating his longer weapon to the side. Depicted. Thank you very much, BD. All right. Um, so here's the play. So we were just talking about, um, you know, what what options does a longer lance person have, right? So to to attempt to beat the longer lance, the shorter lance can hold it low and provoke the uh, the attack. But if the longer lance is clever, the longer lance can hold their own lance low as well. And uh, Kel and I had a, uh, well, we all had a great discussion about this last Wednesday when the Skullers dealt with it. And we came to the conclusion that we think the target of this Countermaster is the enemy's horse. And it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for the opponent to parry the lance held, uh, the longer lance held low. So there's the counter, um, not taking the provocation, threatening the horse, and taking advantage of the length of the lance. And poor horsey. <laughs> well, they were uh, they were expendable and replaceable. If you had enough money. Yep. Yeah. So why wouldn't the cover? Uh of the Zugadori in this case be sufficient to protect the horse? I thought that was kind of one of the points of, of the cover. Right, good, good question. So the, the cover that's going to be deployed up here is against, uh, let me get the snip out. Um, dip, 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 dip. It's going to be deployed against a lance that is held straight in uh, couched, right? So where's my cursor? Oh, it's so small, I can barely see it. So this horse, right, or th this uh, uh, this guy's coming forward at the exact right moment. This lance is going to come up, right, become point on line, and tip this lance away. And it can it can hit the lance precisely because the lance is couched and forward, right, aiming at the man. Whereas here. Um, the lance never comes up. I wonder if I can get the cursor to be bigger. Uh, excuse me. Um, similar to the unmounted fellow later. Waiting there we go. Uh, yeah, to an extent. You're both in boar's tooth. It, it makes it very difficult to beat uh, yeah. another lowered lance. It's the same same issue of uh, full boar's tooth against full boar's tooth with two sword and two hands. If you're both in that guard, wh whoever steps off the line or drops to uh, middle boar's tooth has got a better chance of making a cover. Um, it's pretty hard to make a horse step off line at the charge, mm -hmm. uh, even at the even at the the, the trot. Really, um, they kind of wheel, but they don't really sidestep. Whereas at the at the at the trot, they can dance all over the place if it, they're properly trained and you're a good rider. I've seen all kinds of amazing stuff. Anybody that's ever watched Portuguese bullfighting from horseback has oh, seen, yeah. uh, seen a horse called Diablo that is just a magician. But the guy that's riding him is not just letting the horse do all the work. He's guiding him with perfect timing and sense. So the horse is capable mm -hmm. and the rider is uh, superb. Uh, this, this kind of thing where... If they're both low like this, and you're moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, the, the chance of collision is very high. Uh, in terms of the, the lances colliding and smacking the horses on the left side of their neck, um, but probably not killing either one. So I mean, it's it's just a way to uh, say no, 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 no. You you know that trick? I know I know the same mm -hmm. trick. You know, mm -hmm. it's just the counters. I already know that trick. Yeah, and another thing that that's probably worth mentioning is um, uh, the astute of you will remember that um, we have looked at um, attacking the legs before in Fury. There's that um, particular uh, play in the Largo section of the Sword in Two Hands where um, the uh, the, uh, the Zucadori attacks the upper thigh and we slip the leg and give, give a fendente. Um, and, but we gave the proviso that um you know and fiore says that attacking below the knee is not advisable 
because the legs are far away, you can't cover yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So if the unless if, you're already on the ground, right? That's right. Unless you're already on the ground. So one might ask, well, if um, if the horse is our new feet, then shouldn't that logic apply uh, to the the to mounted combat as well? Shouldn't we focus on the man? And it doesn't, and it, it doesn't specifically because, or at least in main part, because of what Kel just said, which is that the horse cannot slip as easily as we we can a foot, right? The, the horse is not as nimble. Um, the, ho the horse is a pretty big target, and right? A in, vulnerable in target. For, in, in forward motion. Yeah. They can, they can dance around when they're not moving forward quickly. Sure. But once they're moving mm -hmm. forward quickly, they yeah. have to move like a wheel. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure Bruce will back me up on that. But the the issue here is I don't recall on uh, Wednesday night agreeing that the horse was the target on this one. I don't. Oh, really? Oh, well, we, 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 we were speculating. Um, I, I, I just it offered... could be. Could I be. said it could be. But could be. I, I don't agree that it is the target. Sure. The target here is to counter the lance because sure. uh, you can bring the lance point up. And I'm no I'm no expert, but I've mm. certainly watched enough people mm. uh, jousting and, and uh, you know, talked at, at length with how to do this kind of stuff with a fellow, uh, Belgian fellow by the name of Fred Perot while I was fixing parts of his arm. Mm. Um, you know, like, how do you, how do you get the lance up? And he says, mm. you lean back. You lean forward, lean back, turn, just like you would uh, to swing mm. anything else. And, and you use the weight of the horse and time it such that the horse's steps are, are, you know, like, uh, I, I don't remember the exact terminology because also he doesn't speak English as clearly as, as, mm. as and I don't speak French at all. So uh, <clears throat> point being, it's still a play to get the Lance uh, back on target because killing the horse is all well and fine in a, in a pitch battle or, or whatever, mm. but uh, it's not the sort of thing that, you want to waste your time on because putting a lance into a sure. a thousand or twelve hundred pounds of horse is pretty much guaranteed to rip that lance out of your hands or break it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that that's a good plan on horseback to uh, intentionally break your lance. I mean, a lot of them are going to get broken anyways, and they and they certainly did in many battles. But um, I, I don't agree that the horse is the primary target here. The primary target is not to have your uh, sure. lance set aside and to be able to bring it up on on mm -hmm. online. Uh, when you watch really good jousters, uh, modern jousters, I should say, really good modern jousters, uh, they start with their lance up in the air and they, they lower it at pretty much the last minute. They don't run at each other with the lance already in place. And um, somebody explained that to me at one point, or it was on one of those shows where the Knights of Valor had a, sh a season of... Mm -hmm. of they tried to do MMA jousting type of thing. And um, Shane Adams uh, was explaining something about, you know, maneuvering the lance and getting it on point. I mean, if you can hit a ring from a, on, a, on a string or a post at a full gallop, you can move your lance point around at a lower speed. And neither of these horses are, are moving at a, a, a full gallop, I don't believe. Hmm. Cool. Anyway, right. so to get back right, to get right. back to it, I just I just don't necessarily agree that the horse is the target here. It could be, but could be. But okay. cool. I, I I really believe that the man is the target, especially since this uh, the Zug doesn't have a helmet on. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, maybe he was out scouting. I mean, these horses have no bardings on them, anyways. Although the the master here has complete armor, mm -hmm. um, and even an asymmetrical. Uh, shoulder uh, yeah. hot guard um, uh, pauldron sorry uh, I don't I don't believe for a minute that he's not trying to murder the guy that's uh, got uh, no helmet on he's, he's going to try and murder him yeah. anyway all continue all right cool um, any other questions about this one um, yeah I have mm -hmm. one question mm -hmm. um, so if the back to the horse as a target question but if mm -hmm. the target is the horse and mm -hmm. these horses are both running at each other, and mm -hmm. the Zug is planning to raise his lance and strike this scholar. Is there a, is there a chance for the horses to move out of the way after this? Like, isn't the scholar just going to end up stabbing the horse, and then himself getting thrust? Or I, I, well, I don't really understand the mechanics of horses. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, my understanding is that if the longer, uh, 
if this scenario we were talking about plays out, if the longer lance hits first, that's likely going to disrupt the blow of the shorter lance, right? Now, maybe it hits, maybe it doesn't. I'm not ex exactly sure the extent of the disruption. Um, I don't believe it's net, it's it's essentially a double hit scenario, if you if you know what I mean. Um, uh, but um, okay, yeah. <clears throat> if if you drive your lance into the opposing horse. The momentum of that horse, even if you kill it, is going to keep coming forward. And the Zug will have an opportunity then to raise their lance and drive it into the target, that is you, before the horse will, will fall. The horse will collapse. It's possible. But there's yeah, it's a, possible. The, the, distance, yeah. the distance and timing. Remember, you're on two horses that are moving in the same... Um, one... Two, two, two of them coming towards each other. So even if the Zugador's horse stops, if he can bring his lance up, your horse will carry you into the point of his, his lance. At that point. So I, I agree with what, I, what Kel said. If you are riding a horse and you are doing it a full charge, you are not going to be going offline. Once, once set, you're, you're kind of online. Uh, the, the, you have to turn it and think of turning a ship. It's going to be a slow process. <clears throat> so I agree with everything that Cal, or the Cal's observations here is that I, I agree with him. I don't think that the horse would be the target because once one's lance is buried in one's opponent's horse, even if that horse at that moment begins to fall forward, the opponent can still raise the lance and your own horse will be moving forward so you'll be carried into their point. So no, I, I agree with Kel. The idea, the object of this is to knock aside your opponent's lance and if neither of you hit on this pass, you have survived, which is ultimately the goal, I think. Well, so to be, to be clear, the, the, the countermaster isn't parrying, uh, at least in the text anyway. There's no... There's no description of any kind of parry or knock of the uh of the uh the enemy's lance he's carrying his lance oh. low in response to the shorter lance carrying his lance also low so we're kind of speculating about what the engagement might end up being right we're saying maybe it's against the horse maybe it's against the man what would happen yeah and and a bunch of different things might uh might happen can I ask a question um, mm -hmm. more generally about uh, like kind of lances? Um, it, it was always interesting to me. Why do you hold the lance in your right hand and yet position yourself relative to the opponent so you have to reach across your horse? Like I, that, that's kind of how adjusting always works. But I, I guess I'm curious as to why. So the horses don't collide. But uh, ah, what do you make passing. sense? Uh, oh, I see. What you mean. Uh, it depends. Uh, that's there's one called the joust of war and one called the joust of peace. If you are in a war on a war on a battlefield situation, you want the target to be off to the right. Even though your shield is on the left, you want the target to be off there on the right because their shield is on the, the left, and it's easier to manipulate and it's easier to hit things to the right. The reason the jousters do it is because they're not trying to kill each other. They're trying to hit each other's shields. Mm -hmm. Why they do it in a joust, there's a barrier to keep them in different, separate lanes, and they are reaching off to the left. That's why they do it in the joust, is because... Um, that's very much a Western European thing. French, uh, French, low countries, England, that sort of thing. In Italy... The uh, the barrier wasn't as mm, uh, uh, common and expected uh, uh, until uh, later than Fiore's period. Um, it, it's it's it, this is open field fighting. Uh, these guys are are not uh, playing for fun because, as he says, with sharpened spears, with sharpened iron, um, these are these are playing in earnest, and this could be. Uh, in a in a deed of arms or, or some sort of challenge or, or judicial duel, but it it's just as likely that it's skirmishing outside of uh, you know a city under siege. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll 
back you off from that because it's very easy for us today to get wrapped up in how things are done based on modern jousting and reenactments and ren fairs and so on and there's very very good reason for having a barrier in a, in a peaceful um, deed of arms or, or, or tournament or whatever mm -hmm. but um, fighting in the open totally different story there's an amazing book uh, was written in the late 70s uh, called the Kundatieri by uh, George Trias I believe George or Gerard Trias, but Trias is the last name anyways. And he, he basically talks about these, these captains of fortune and various things. And Niccolo d'Esti is one of the characters in, in one chapter uh, and, and some of the mercenaries that worked around him. Uh, and the kind of nonsense that they did in, op in an open field to fight. Um, the business about trying to have a lance on your right side, um, if you had a shield on your left side, uh, I'm going to disagree with you there, Bruce, um, with a sword. Yeah, definitely. But these guys are passing pretty clearly. They're passing shield side to shield side, uh, left to left. And that's not an uncommon thing. If you've got a shield to protect yourself like the Zug has, I'm not really sure whether the the, uh, the countermaster here has a shield or not. I, I don't recall this image in de great detail. I haven't looked at the high res of this stuff in years. But uh, in the previous passage they both had a crunch shields and uh, when you've got that going on you're not going to aim for the right side because that'll mean your right side will be open as well um, typically two people just running at each other like this was something that would have happened after the mass charge ever and then everything broke up so uh, you know this is this is one of these things i think is more of a skirmish situation than uh you know, like a, a true war or a true tournament situation. That's that's my opinion based on what I've read of the situation of tournaments and she, and the gigantic, gigantic amount of material about things that went on as sieges, like just unbelievable yeah. amounts of stuff. That's that's quite Anyways, correct. Bruce, there you go. The, uh, the question was why does it uh, was why does he see it so often to the left? And in our popular culture right now, we only show jousting. But the lancers in the 19th century were trained to strike both on the left and on the right. And yeah, they would but have they had no, and they had no armor. Even curiouser armor um, was pretty feeble stuff. Like the the heavy cavalry uh, of the Napoleonic period. Their, their breastplates, I mean, you could put a, a, a ball through it pretty quickly. Uh, certainly the, the light lances they were using compared to a medieval lance is, there is, is, like, a, is like a Dixie stick compared to a club. Um, uh, what's often described as a 14-foot lance, and I'm not really sure why it's described that way, say in Frost or uh, whether the, the terminology is that way and how it was translated. Um, Steve Mulberger translated, retranslated great sections of, of that um, to correct some Victorianisms. And uh, in his, uh, you know, Deed of Arms uh, book, he, he talks about this a fair bit. Um, I'm pretty sure there's something about this in uh, a book called The Medieval War Horse, oddly enough. A very small book. Uh, and only about a hundred pages or so, but it was put out in the late eighties. Um, I can't, I can't remember the author's name, but it was basically talking about why they selected the horses, how they trained the horses, this sort of thing. And the whole business of, um, you know, bringing the lance to the left side of the horse kept your shield or your heaviest part of your armor. If, if the King, or I should say the counter King here has uh, a really heavy, uh, asymmetrical pauldron, which the Italians pretty much invented around this period, uh, was a really new thing. Uh, I, personally, I, I'm not really sure because this isn't the high. This isn't the high res copy, is it? Uh, the high res copy of the Getty. Um, the yeah. uh, the image is high res, but I actually have the image somewhere on my com my computer. Okay. Um, now, and, and my point being, I haven't looked at the high res copy equestrian section for quite a while. Because there's, uh, mostly I'm interested in the foot section for obvious reasons. Um, but my, my point is if you've got uh, a shield on your left arm and, and your bridle hand, uh, that's the side you're going to present to any threat. 
uh, for the simple reason that, well, what's the point of it if you don't use it? It's just uh, not uh, not sensible. It's not common. Uh, it doesn't. It, it's just, it, it, it defies logic, as it were. And in, in this case, uh, there's a thing that I'm sure he said something early on uh, in the equestrian section where it's about if you have if you have a lance or strong armor, you can pass on the right. And if you don't, then you need to pass on the, on the left or something. I can't remember hmm, even it if it's later. in this. Maybe it's later. It I might just be later. Yeah. Uh, it's something that, that we that came, it came up yeah. on uh, on Wednesday night, and I don't recall the exact uh, must be later. point of it. Anyways, yeah, let's mm. let's continue on and not get bogged down here. Okay. Um, all right. So the next play we have here, two more plays of the lance. Um, that they're the same, uh, the same master, even though they're drawn two separate images. Uh, folio forty-one verso, and we'll go forty-one verso A and B which is right here. Oops. And uh, Bruce, would you kindly like to read this one for us? This is another way to carry the lance against another lance. This master has a short lance and carries it in left posta di donna, as illustrated, to parry and strike. Thank you, Bruce. All right. And here we are. We might as well read both of them. Uh, I suppose. Um, you want to read the second one there, Bruce, as well? Okay. Uh, this master also carries his lance in left posta di donna to beat away that his lance, the, the lance that his opponent is about to hurl at him. He could also perform the same defense with a staff or short sword. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right. And here, oh, whoa. Where did that go? Dude, you're making me dizzy. I'm sorry, man. Hey, the the <laughs> the, the wiki's. Uh... No, I know, I know, I know. I'm just joking. No, I'm sorry. I... Uh. Oh no. Okay, here we go. All right. Sorry, guys. I, my my sincere apologies. All right. Um. Okay. So um. We have uh, another posta with another basic defense. Uh, one against a couch lance and the other against a lance that is, um, or uh, some object that looks like it's going to be thrown. And uh, there, the master here is carrying his um, short spear in left post that he don't know. With the broad concept being the engagement is going to be similar to the one, uh, the exchange of point we saw before, except it's going to come from above, which is something that we already know we can do with the sword. We can exchange the point from both above and below, so too with the lance. Yeah. This is a very clear view that uh, because neither of them is carrying a shield or has uh, substantial armor on, they're passing weapon on weapon so that they're going to engage. And the guy that wants to throw his lance uh, knows that he's got to stop the master. Like it, it's his whole objective is to stop the master, even if he disarms himself, and and very likely if if you're facing uh, you know numerous people on the battlefield, and your colors or your 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 coat armor is such that you're very recognizable as a, a worthy ransom uh, opportunity, someone throwing a lance at you, whether they hit you or not, it's pretty unlikely they're going to throw the lance trying to kill you. They're probably going to throw at the horse or to force you to do something that is no threat to them. So if he throws the lance and wheels and the next guy behind him mm. uh, comes in and, and, and takes you down, well, that's all well and fine. Yeah. If he wants to just, just drive you away, uh, you know, he can hurl his lance at you and force you to defend yourself or to dodge. And you, you notice that... The Zugadori's horse is uh, sort of leaping or charging. Um, I, I hesitate to use the word charge because that's a very specific thing in my mind. I think Bruce Bruce might have a different opinion on that, but um, it's it's not trotting because its feet are are um, uh, uh, parallel, whereas the uh, the master's horse or the countermaster, whatever his horse is 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 at a walk or a trot. Mm -hmm. you know, so he's moving more slowly, more cautiously. Uh, 
Can two what's horses that, that are canter. Um, I can't remember what canter means. What's canter mean? Well, uh, I know that there's a difference between walk, walk, trot, yes, canter. So there's blah, walk, blah, blah, blah. there's trot, which jogs from side to side. There's canter, which is a three beat and a pause in the air motion, which is faster yet. Uh, and then there's gallop, okay. which is four beats, one, two, three, four. However, gotcha. the thing that you're looking at is an artistic convention which existed up until Richard Moybridge took his photograph of a galloping horse because all horses showing galloping were shown like this in artwork until the, la the end of the 19th century. So these horses are understood to be galloping. Gotcha. Because they they didn't because they didn't have the freeze frame imagery to show how motion happened, so it's a convention. But these horses are gal understood to be galloping, and the other ones are understood to be walking, because there are three feet on the ground and one raised. Perfect. Thank you cool. very much for clarifying that. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that from Wednesday night because I was thinking, boy, well, I wish Bruce was here Wednesday night to sort some of this out for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, quick cool question. So, are these two separate plays, or just kind of two extensions of the same play? So they're they, essentially the same play, two yeah. different problems. Yeah, they appear to be same. the same master. Okay. Against two different uh, problems, yeah, as Kel said. And you see something similar in the sword in one hand. So he's you got three people, one cutting, one thrusting. Yeah, and, and yeah. you also see it in um in the section that joins, um the dagger and sword uh is a tiny section it's only four plays and the next thing on from there if i'm not mistaken is um uh, three guys coming on towards him much like the the one with the single sword but he's lying in in uh Kodalanga on the right and he says i could also do this from another he says another position and I'm, I'm not, i don't think it's tail but i think he i think it's uh yeah. Mi yeah. middle middle uh, middle iron gate or full bore's tooth i can't remember which mm -hmm. but in, in that section there's this one plate and it's a it's sort of a an introduction you guys want to come at me and this is another way that i can cover it and Kota Longa is a terrific place to make these covers from because you can also uh make a gigantic pivoting pass offline uh so you're you know you're there for a moment and then you're not and you're beating down the weapon that's uh targeted at the space you just left mm -hmm. so in this particular case um he, he's got somebody who's the, the zugidori in both of these cases has someone who's confident not moving fast and hard towards him is is very conscious of what the the, the zoo is trying to accomplish and um they know they've got a they've got a at them you got to get at these masters mm -hmm. and of course the confidence of the master is displayed through the uh, you know the, the the posta and also the speed of the horse because uh, if you're trying to run away from something you're that's that's probably too difficult to deal with this is the last place you're going to be in. Yeah, for sure. you're not going to want to ride in this position mm -hmm. I, I myself find it very very interesting uh, I've, I've never tried it myself on horseback, but I've certainly done this many, many times uh, with our our pseudo horse uh, briskly walking past each other. Uh, when someone takes this and, and walks past you at a real brisk walk, it's a very different thing than standing and fighting and, and playing for measure because the measure collapses constantly. It's mm -hmm. always, always collapsing, and that's mm -hmm. the one constant about... Um, the equestrian combat is they're going to close they're not mm -hmm. backing up mm -hmm. uh whereas in as quite a few of the plays especially like uh, uh left uh, window in polax you're specifically told to make a, a little a little faint or a little deke out and and then take a step back to make your cover well there's really no difference here except you're constantly moving forward so your timing has to be that much more difficult uh as as the distance collapses mm -hmm. now I, I like that he does it from Posey to Donna here, but then he does it from uh, tail as well. And this is where we get the concept of left tail in uh, our sort of one hand actions. That's coming yeah. up. Sorry. I'm, I'm spoilers, buddy. Spoilers. <laughs> I hope they're all spoilers for everyone. I mean, I, I mean, I hope there's no spoilers for everyone, but uh, 
All right. Well, I yeah. Hope that, move that people have at least looked at this stuff, and yeah. you know, because the translations have been out for quite a while. Yes, I think 2008 were the was the first uh, the first one by oh, uh, something like that. I, I remember the ex, I remember the Exiles one was the first one I ever saw. The, the, the ex, Exiles one of was the, really, of the PD. really yeah. shoddy. Um, mm-hmm. The it was it was as bad or worse than Chittister's. <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, I mean, Mike Mike Chittister does a lot of work in a lot of different languages, and you can't be an expert in every damn thing. I mean, you know. Um, Very true. He's, he's he's got a lot of energy for this kind of stuff, and uh, he, at this point, he's trying to make a living at it. So, you know, I, I don't fault the guy. I'm just saying it's not a particularly yeah. good quality uh, one. And and for a non-Italian speaker, I'm taking this from Italian speakers saying, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, the same thing with the Colin Hatcher one. Anywhere where the Italian gets really difficult, he just leaves it in Italian. It doesn't make any sense out of it. And yeah. That's kind of kind of not practical for us as students of the art um all right the next uh the next folio we have folio 42r and let's go 42r a and b and uh connor would you like to read this one for us okay this is the counter to the play we have just seen master with the lance uh, wrong, one. wrong one. Oh, whoops what are that 42. 42. Oh, you're, you're right. 42. You're right. Sorry, my bad. 42R. I was wondering what was going on there. I was testing you. You passed. <laughs> Sorry, well, think, go ahead. I think Bruce has read this more than any of us. <laughs> Sorry, Connor, go ahead. A, B? Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. My book in front of me is slightly out of order. This master who is fleeing is not in armor. As his horse runs fast, he throws backward thrusts with his lance to strike his opponent. If he turns to his right, he can place himself in Dente di Cingaro with his lance, or in left posta di Donna. He could parry and strike as is possible in the first and third plays of the lance. All right, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Thank mm. you very much, Connor. Okay. So here we have a 42 R A and B. And we have this little interesting uh, ditty. Um, if you didn't know anything about horsemanship or fighting on horseback, you probably wouldn't think that you could do something like this. But sure enough, you can. There it is. And it was just well enough known that in the uh, mid 15th century, Talhofer includes exactly the same uh, technique, and then. The technique that follows it is shooting a latchet crossbow backwards <laughs> over your shoulder. Over your shoulder. Oh boy, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, a latchet crossbow, for those that aren't familiar, is a crossbow that you can span with one arm. So you put the the crossbow down into your right stirrup, and you and you pull back the uh, the string. Or there's a sort of a built-in. Uh, bar, a goat. It's called a goat's foot, but it is a sort of a built-in bar and a latch crossbow. So you pull back the string with that. It's not your fingers pulling the string back, or it just wouldn't have enough power. Uh, a latch crossbow is not something that you want to be, uh, you know, shooting at heavy targets with. Uh, a latch crossbow is is for light horsemanship, and uh, were heavily, heavily used in the English and Scottish borders through this exact period right into the early uh, early 17th century when handguns became much more reliable and inexpensive because a latch of crossbows dirt cheap anyway continue what's uh, up Richard? this hmm? same point of interest this same technique was taught to lancers all over europe from the early 1800s to the end of the to the yeah, early absolutely. 20th century yeah. Yeah. And is even referenced a variant of that in Patton's sword manual. Is it? Interesting. Is it? Okay, I've read Patton's, Patton's sword manual was about 1913 or something like that. Um, and, yeah. and, and mostly it's about sword and modes of practice and things like that. But does, he just references it. Like he mentions it. it there's no image of them. No, no, no. He has a number of exercises mounted horseback. Uh, where the, remember the 1908 Cavalry Sabre, which is what Patton really based his on, it's a virtually right. identical, was uh-huh. designed to be slightly longer and pointed and to replace the lance. Really? In horse. 
because of the because of their experience in the Boer Wars, the British oh, okay. experience in. The... Well, because the, so, the the British basically a... gave up gave up Lancers after the Crimean War, from my understanding, or pretty much a for no, free they, only. They actually had Lancers in 1917. However, the um, the technique of uh, live, taking your your lance. Twisting it around over the horse's head so the butt of the lance is off to the front left and the point is to the right rear and then driving to the right rear is a constant in Polish, French, German, and English and American lance manuals from the, ninth, the, the um, eight, 19th century. Yeah. Just a point of fact. Just yeah, a point I've, of interest. I've, I've seen it in, um, I say, uh, as I say, mid-19th century British and French sources, but I wasn't familiar that Patton had that, or I've forgotten it because it's been so long since I read that. But I uh, know it's it's really amazing stuff. How even though armor went away, um, a lot of the the techniques and the horsemanship really didn't uh, change tremendously from the medieval period uh, through the Renaissance. The horses were massive, and the armor was massive, and because they had to deal with uh, early firearms. But the, the lances were so huge that they were a threat unto themselves. Um, I mean, the, the idea that you could run somebody through the visor and have your helmet, uh, have him literally held up by the space between his eyebrows and the helmet and have him on the end of the horse and yet be a good enough horseman and landsman to carry the fellow's basically still body uh, to the point where you could set him down gently, and after a couple of days, this guy woke up. And I'm pretty sure that one's in Frostard. I mean, these people knew what they there's were also, doing. They weren't just amateurs. There's also a technique where you do it to the left rear. But what oh, he's saying... Sure? What, now, I want to comment on the second part of this. When he's saying you, you drive back to the right and then you turn around, mm -hmm. this is also explicitly explained in manuals later on, is that the objective at this point, if you are the king, the crowned one here, is to get your horse to turn around to face the enemy so you do a sharp right-hand turn with your horse. And you try and do that at speed. At speed, it's going to be a more gentle curve, but the idea is always to try and get around so that you're turning around towards your pursuer. So your pursuer right. is now um, coming at you from the right hand, from your mm -hmm. right side. Uh, Patton right. even talks about mm -hmm. exercise where that is the, the goal of the exercise between horsemen running around the arena. And it was trained into cavalrymen, lancemen throughout the 19th century that we know of. I know because these are in the manuals. And this is him referencing that same trick, is that you have to get your horse to turn around. Now, if you can get far enough ahead to bring your horse to a slow, mm -hmm. to a collected gallop and spin on the spot, you, you know, you're gravy. But in any case, the objective was always to get your horse to turn around so that your opponent is now in front of you. Yeah, and that, that seems to be the broad and broad strokes what he's suggesting. Um, he says if you have a fast horse, um, and and you're yeah, not an armor, a little space, a little yeah. space to make that. Yeah. Yeah. So he's getting some space to turn around and then to do one of the two things that we just we just learned, either at the defense when okay. Dentity Chingado or in left post to Tidona. I am a very, I'm barely barely competent if that i think i might be stretching to say i'm a competent rider uh, and i can make a horse do that so that for somebody that's really good and and, and I'll, I'll reference that same uh, portuguese bullfighting horse uh, diablo that's all he's doing is he's spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning in front of the bull so i mean he's got he's fast enough and his rider is keeping him far enough ahead of the bull that he can do these pirouettes in front of him and um, mostly the pirouettes are for show, but by the third or second or third uh, turn, the the the, land, the uh, 
Toriator, what's the word for it? I can't remember. Uh, the, the rider of the, of the horse uh, turns and he files a lance into that horse. And it's not a full-sized lance like these, it's a dart, right? But he plows another dart into him. And it's just, it's... It's a little gruesome, but if you know, if you if you don't really mind uh, the the fact that you know animals and people all die at some point, they they've served their purpose. Then the the concept of watching that sort of bullfighting is more about the skill uh, involved than it is about the death, the eventual death of of one creature or another. Because there's always a chance uh, that you know the <laughs> the bull wins. Oh, there's a joke about that in Spain about you know, somebody going to a hotel the day after or a ro- uh, restaurant the day after uh, the, the night after uh, bullfighting, and one of the the really gigantically expensive and and uh, I don't know what you call uh, desirable classical uh, treats whatever is out the bull's testicles that was killed that day and uh, one of the joke of course is you know this is rich american guy orders the dish after watching the bullfighting of the day and, and uh, everybody in the restaurant kind of looks down and the waiter comes out and puts the plate before him when he pulls the cover off of these two tiny little testicles there and he's going like, what the hell this is not a bull's testicle and the waiter says i'm very sorry senor sometimes the bull wins <laughs> that's good that's good. I like that. <laughs> that's morbid and awesome. It's uh, a great joke. It's a good joke. Especially when a, a when a movie. Spanish when a Spanish waiter tells you the joke. Yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> Sometimes the bull wins. I like it. <laughs> I gotta remember that one. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> the next play, forty two R C and D. And we have our first um, master with a sword. <laughs> Sometimes the bull wins. That's good. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, did we hit Connor already? Yeah, Connor did. Did. Yep. Graham. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this position of the sword against the lance is very good to parry the lance as you ride to the opponent's right side. This guard is also good against all other handheld weapons. That is axe, staff, sword, and so on. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, here we go. We have left post the Didona. Um, passing on the right side. And he says it's good against whatever. Um, I think uh, another thing that Kel mentioned on Wednesday was that the engagement here is going to be similar to um, the engagement uh, that we would make against a blow to the right side uh, when we are we have the sword in one hand when we're lying in Cotalunga, right? It's going to be a true edge engagement uh, with the true edge facing our right with a point on line. And in, in this particular case, uh, because he's because he's in left post to Didana, he can make Fedente or he can make Mezzano. Yeah. Whereas where he's in tail, he can make Sotana if measures right but mostly he's going to be making masana because from from tail if you make uh pendente it's a big long arc and with horses moving together you don't have the time that's my general opinion on it it could be proven wrong by reality but my general opinion is uh having ridden horses uh at you know like around each other and goofing around and stuff like that uh, they close really quick <laughs> You know, like yeah. there's there's not a lot of spare time uh and when one horse for example freaks out for some reason gets spooked by something getting your horse out of the way because the horse your horse might be going hey, do, 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 do. oh there's some tasty looking flowers Wah! what's this guy doing you know kind of thing and and horses are like that they'll they'll just freak out at, at stuff that they see coming sideways at them because they're herd animals they're herbivores and and prey animals and Anything that comes sideways at them all of a sudden freaks them out. Mm. Uh, certainly, a fellow I used to know a really long time ago uh, was training to ride in a parade. We, in, in, he had Norman armor, and he was training to ride in a parade. And he always trained with just a big stick, like a uh, you know a quarter staff type of thing. And the horse didn't give a damn. Well, the day they get out to ride in the parade, he's got this painted spear with spirals on it, and the horse was having 
none of it. Anytime he brought that thing down beside the horse's neck, the horse freaked out, just freaked out because the spirals for some reason were uh, some sort of uh, trigger. I'm not really sure why. Maybe prey have uh, you know uh, shape like that, or or have make shadows that that seem to spiral. Or something. I have no idea, but I remember him saying that he'd worked and paid all this money to you know ride and then rented the horse and whatnot. And he and you know the last time he rode with his full armor on and he brings this stupid lance out, it was like the horse had never seen him before. So it, it's pretty interesting about the things that horses can be trained to do and also their natural reactions i don't know maybe bruce has got some kind of story similar to that because a horse that has never seen it before will assume it is a threat it's just their sight that's that's the way their brain works period don't don't so know what it is don't if, don't want nothing to do with it if you want your horse to go into a parade then before long before the parade you get that horse used to flags and bands and paper bags and plastic bags floating around. Actually, and the horse was, the horse was no forth. problem with all of that kind of stuff because the horse had been in no. many parades, like just Western riding exactly. sort of thing. And it was, exactly. and he even got, and he spent when time getting things. used to his armor and stuff. And his, and wearing Norman armor is like it's mail, it's just slinky. And what he used to do was he'd leave his mail on a tree like a, a cross tree type of thing in the horse's stable so it was there all the time the horse didn't care anymore and he'd go and he'd put it on and he'd put exactly. on half of it and the horse didn't care but it was the lance of the last minute right? so, so, so he'd put that lance in the room as long as he put his arm in his room it probably wouldn't have been an issue but it was just if one of those things that he, that he mentioned to me that really yeah. really surprised me yeah yeah see the lance was new and the horse had never yeah. experienced it before yeah, yeah. So what's awesome. what? No, no way for this man. I'm out of here. Yeah. And he said it was the same sort of thing. He couldn't do anything. So what he ended up doing was dropping the lance, keeping his shield, and uh, just holding a sword over his shoulder. You know, not necessarily like this, but just kind of like you know, carrying it over his shoulder like a like a bar or, or a staff or whatever. But uh, he said he said it really surprised him that the horse was so freaked out by this spiral painted stick whereas the unpainted stick was no consequence whatsoever anyways uh, things things that this is what made to my mind this is what made medieval war horses of the various classes so vastly expensive um and andrew Aitren's book really goes into a great detail about this that the medieval war horse in the hundred years war uh, it really goes into a lot of detail about this because they were professional trainers that had standards it wasn't some you know like a regional thing where you go here and they trained it this way and you go to a different place and they trained it a different way if you were looking for a particular type of war horse whether the thing was trained in in some city in the low countries or was trained in france or was trained in normandy you know they they stuck to the same standards because these horses were shipped all over the place they were purchased by people of means of course from anywhere in Western Europe. So you might get someone from Southern France going to Normandy to buy uh, a war horse and, and maybe a couple of other lesser horses uh, or to buy a couple of war horses for his household. And he would get the, the nicest one for himself, of course. And then he'd get ones that were maybe like two thirds the price or half the price for his retainers. And this kind of thing was very common. And, and of course, when wars were over, just like armor, value of horses dropped almost nothing uh, when the english left uh, france after many of their campaigns the price of horse flesh uh, dropped in in uh, the low countries because the english always exited through the low countries uh, the horses were too expensive to ship back it was really expensive to ship them over in the first place but they had to because it wasn't guaranteed you'd be able to find enough war horses for whatever uh, troops were available but on the way back man the horses were literally sold for dog feed and you're talking about a horse that's, that was two or three years of training put into it on a daily basis. Uh, it's it's kind of sad, but that's it's really kind of sad. But then when you look at it, it's like, well, I can always buy another horse. Yeah. And can you I might ever get a text real quick? Yeah, yeah sure. Show while the conversation. The text of the this one here? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Here we go. Good. 
Okay. So, in, in other words, dealing with somebody on foot with a staff or a pole axe or whatever, because you just do not use a pole axe on, on uh, horseback. Uh, you see a few illustrations in the Machiavsky Bible of uh, people using something that in some bizarre form of pole axe. Uh, you know, like some sort of great chopper on a stick type of thing. And there's all kinds of it with, you know, uh, guts peeling out and stuff like that. But you have to remember that they're trying to tell a story from the Old Testament. And they're trying to make the, uh, the heroes of the Old Testament the way that we think of like Captain America and Superman and Iron Man today. Doing things that the average person could not do because they were the great heroes. So, you know, when you hear people, I, I just love it from the uh, Battle of Nations people and you know, that sort of attitude as well. Here it's in the Machiavelli Bible, you can cut a guy in half and his guts will fall out. And it's like, mm, no. Even in full male armor, taking a sword uh, in one hand and cutting through a person from head to toe. No. How about no? But if you were, a, a, if you were a Goliath, yeah. Well, only Maybe a super Goliath. Well, yeah. Goliath. Goliath is always shown standing there. Goliath of Gath. Position, and the next thing, he's laying on the ground with a stone on his forehead. Yeah. Every time. I'm so stoned. Yeah. 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 Like, well, well, I, all I can say is, having watched some videos of these guys from the Bear Lake Island, who are the known slingers of the time, so so yeah, well they're known they're accurate. Yeah. The, the, the term for slinger in Latin is bailerus. Yeah. Or Bill era or something like that. Mm -hmm. These guys are frightening, and they're, and yeah, they're chucking, sure. chucking uh, you know, sometimes they were chucking rocks, but they also had cast lead pellets that looked kind of like an egg. Yeah, frightening. It's frightening. Something like that would cave in your forehead pretty bad if you For didn't sure. have a decent helmet. So 90% of the people on the, on the field had, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if they had a helmet, it was open face. But in mm -hmm. many cases, they had nothing more than a leather cap or some mm -hmm. kind of padded hood or whatever. And man, one of those things is mess up your yeah. day I'll ruin your day yeah. did, you, did you see Anyways, what you wanted you... Uh, uh alex alex you got that yep thanks got what you needed there great good all Sorry, right i'm, I'm no waxing problem. eloquent no problem all right so speaking of um uh maybe needing another horse we have 42 verso and we have a countermaster to the uh sword in ladonna held in ladonna so this is 42 d donna uh, 42 you and, v you and Brian, come on, man. Well, if we didn't fuck it up all the time, then you couldn't correct us all the time. You see, so this is a yeah, mutually... but I'm not gonna be around to correct you. <laughs> I'm not gonna be around. It's okay. You can just call me at random unless times I, and say, unless I win Donna. the lottery. D Donna. Like, if I call you, if I call you, it's gonna be talk to your wife. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. So, uh, who, Kel, would you like to read this one? 42 A of V. Very pleased with himself. Thank you. Okay. This is the counter to the play we've just seen. The master with the lance carries his weapon low to strike the horse in the head or chest, which is too low for the opponent to beat it aside with his sword. Bastard this. All right. There it is. Pretty plain and That's simple. Similar to the first counter, I guess? Yes. Yeah, the idea is the same. In this in this particular case, you're definitely going to target the horse because you've got no chance of reaching your lance. Whereas in the previous one, uh, you may or may not be targeting the horse for good reasons, as as, as mm -hmm. uh, Bruce pointed out earlier about the the inertia of the dying horse mm -hmm. uh, coming, you know, bringing you forward with your lance. It's kind of like uh, these people trained to to kill wild boars and bears and stuff like that in the woods. And this is the sort of training they had for actual blood uh, contact, as opposed to, you know, someone getting killed in training. You went out and you hunted because hunting was very important. Destroying um, dangerous animals was very important because to protect the communities that supplied you with food and money and taxes and whatnot. Um, is very common thing throughout most of uh, Western Europe and all the way from the, you know, from the tip of Spain to the most northern forests of Finland, uh, wild boars are very common and they're nasty, 
the ill-tempered, powerful creatures that smash through heavy brush. They like to live in heavy brush. They don't go in the open very often. If you're hunting deer or whatever, it's unlikely the deer is going to charge your horse. It, it's not going to happen that often. But it, 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 it happened often enough that a stag would take out five or six of the hounds that you had harassing it and then would turn in its fury on whatever else came nearby. And um, if you had a plain lance with no cross on it, it would run itself up the lance, and boars especially, and bears also as well, although not as commonly hunted with spears, um, they would rush themselves right up the lance. Uh, uh, a feral hog, even today, and, and through most of southern uh, United States, they're pretty frightening creatures, and nobody really hunts them with lances or knives or whatever, whereas in Hawaii, they... They like to stick the pig with a big knife, the equivalent of uh, like a short sword. Um, they don't use what we would call a dagger or a Gerber knife or, a, you know, like a marine K-bar type of thing. They use a big frickin' thing about the size of a machete, but much, much narrower. And uh, they're designed specifically to punch through as a thrust. You're not supposed to try to cut the the hog because it's going to murder you it's going to rip your leg open or rip your guts open if it gets you on the ground um, when the Hawaiians hunt the pig which is a really amazing thing they still do they go after it and they have you know they'll have dogs or they'll have beaters or whatever but the idea is that the, the animal lunges at you you dodge to the side and you stab it try to stab it through the heart uh, because to have stabbing it in the head is pointless. It, it's, there's so little brain and so much skull that it's very, very difficult. Another thing that they can do is rip the guts out of them. So if they happen to knock the thing off its feet as it charges, as they sidestep and they knock it down, then they'll, you know, they'll cut the guts open because this very thin hide along the belly compared to the the hugely thick hide along the top. Um, well, the same problem with bears. Bears have so much loose skin on them that it's very very hard to slash them you can you know you can slash a bear with a sword the way you would kill a human being with a sword but the bear will take it just take it uh you've got to puncture their you got to puncture their torso you got to get the heart or the lungs or whatever to knock them down you can't count on killing them by the brain like a for example a grizzly bear can withstand a 308 round in the forehead it, it can survive it its skull is that thick between its eyes and above its and between its ears whereas if you shoot it from underneath uh, or in the mouth you can get at the brain stem and kill it well these people spent their lives listening to their uncles and their cousins and their fathers telling stories about all oh, this great boar you know that we fought the thing was so clever and blah 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 didn't go down like a normal boar did it was a real survivor and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they hear these things and then they get out there and live it because it's part of their culture. The nobility is there, a very tiny uh, populace to live off of the major part of the populace, the farming, you know, the agrarian community and to some extent the merchant class. But their job was also to protect them because if they couldn't stop the crops from being destroyed, it was to everybody's detriment. So hunting was a really common thing, not only for food, but to protect the environment that you ruled over, that you you, you control over. There's uh, Gaston Phoebus' hunting book is a great book about uh, um, a lot of hunting techniques and the ideas that went into various types of hunting, but it wasn't that much about why really wide so there's a lot of other material out there about why the second estate which was the the nobles uh why the second estate was so important in the order of the world because they had the arms and the power and the leisure time to do things that 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 regular peasants simply couldn't do even if they had the guts and the tools which they generally didn't so uh, the ability to ride on a horse and kill something was developed through hunting and also unit uh, cohesion was developed through hunting with the people that you would eventually end up uh, fighting beside.
So all of this stuff was training for war. And this is what bears it out, your ability to move the lance around very quickly and to target very accurately. Because when a, you know, a 600 pound uh, boar is charging at your horse, you want to stop it. You don't want to waste that horse. You want to kill that beast and eat it and uh, really enjoy the the notoriety of being someone who can protect their people because that makes people a lot more willing to pay for their taxes, their land, whatever, because you're clearly a provider of security. Um, if you couldn't do these kind of things, you'd be pretty much useless in society. And this is why it's so important that Fiori's got all these techniques to defeat people that were you know, of moderate skill or, or adequate or competent skill. He's got techniques that show how to defeat someone who knows what they're doing but isn't an expert. He expects you to be an expert. Would you like Guess to read the next, that, uh, the next play there, Kel? I'll read the next, I'll read right, the next uh, part. Good. Sorry. Okay, can I just and ask with, a question? With, sure. With less, mm -hmm. ask the question. question sure. about the counter. Uh, I just, mm -hmm. I just uh, kind of realized that. So um, you said that it made sense to attack the horse because the enemy is holding a short sword. Uh, why wouldn't uh, you also be able to attack the, the, the guy? Because he could cover your lance, whereas the horse can't cover your lance. Yeah. And you, uh, when the enemy had a lance, he could also you cover can't, this you can't, the counter master. Yeah, it's a counter this master. This is the counter master to the previous play, and that's why he's targeting the horse. Because the previous play yeah. explained but if you're targeting him, you can counter him with this. So, so we okay. we were we were uh, theorizing pre previously, Alex, that against the lance, it's possible that the horse might be the target because it might similarly be difficult to affect a good cover on to to the, to the lowered lance. But it's also possible that um, the 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 man on the horse was also the target it's just the lance was kept low until the last moment or some other such thing uh, but there's a sim the similar broad concept here is that um, to counter the posta um, that the uh, the opponent is, is is holding you place the target at a place where the posta can't reach or the the the, the resulting action can't reach yeah the weapon simply can't reach that far in front of the horse's head. Yeah. So you'd be able to put your hand, your your lance into the chest or throat of the oncoming horse with the guy with the sword, and the guy with the sword couldn't do anything about it. Um, the uh, long does that make sword sense? standing up in the saddle, leaning forward over the horse's neck, the long sword barely reaches in front of the horse's head. Yeah. So... It yeah. is and and you're already in medieval styles. You're that. already standing, so there's no more there's no more distance to stand. Like you can do that exactly. in a western saddle. You can you can increase your height above the western saddle by standing on the stirrups, but you cannot do that in a medieval saddle because the stirrups are set with your legs straight. So you have a lot of um, uh, strong strength in in your sitting your seating. But you don't have the opportunity to stand up any farther. The best you can do is stand up above the uh, the, the cantle, I think is the word, uh, of the of a saddle. And even then, it's not very oh. easy because medieval saddles, the pom yeah, well, medieval saddles didn't have pommels on them. They had uh, what's what's no, cantle? Have, cantle is a blocky. The thing cantle is at the back. Cantle is at the oh. back. The pommel okay. is what's, at the front. Medieval okay. pommels. We're usually large sword. and broad to protect you. Okay, to so, protect your okay, so you're okay. Your so they use the same term for oh, yeah. uh, a, a horn as in later periods, like in Western uh, periods, than than they did uh, in the medieval period. Because I've seen an awful lot of yes. uh, hunting yes, saddles yes. in Spain, for example, in in the in the. Uh, Armeria Real in Madrid, there are about 70 hunting saddles, and they all have these broad, what I would call a bolster, instead of a cantle, in, in, I guess I guess cantle is the wrong word, um, a bolster in, in the front, and you, you really can't reach over it. It blocks your thighs completely, 
and uh, for some extent, it in the in the tournament saddles, you could see um, a much more built up defense, almost like an external piece of armor or a small shield built right onto the either side of the shield or either side of the saddle. But in the hunting saddles, um, there's the same. What do you put? Is cantle where you put your butt cheeks in these things? Yes. The cantle is that large. The cantle is that it large. Is the thing that, uh, that, that cups the cups the hips. Right? The, rear. The, right. the hips, yeah. Okay. So the part so, that's in front of you towards the horse's withers um, is still called the horn, even though it's like a big bar. It's a pommel with a horn. Pommel. A pommel of the okay. saddle refers to the front of the saddle. If it's got a horn uh, on it, it's not horn. Uh, it's yeah, because they all have a big pommel. bolster on them. All Western saddles have a bolster. Uh, uh, yes. English saddles are just a freaking postage stamp with straps on it. Um, okay, cool. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for explaining cool. that. Uh, my point being that reaching over forward of a medieval saddle is not something you can easily do because you're already standing in the saddle your legs no, are straight you, you, pointed forward you could not easily do it in a western saddle no. either but the no point it'd be hard is that in a in a medieval typical medieval saddle which would have a high pommel and and a bolster in front uh, and the pommel being the front of the saddle, okay. even if one leaned forward over that and reached forward with the sword. You, you just can't go far. Not, you can't go far. The distance isn't very far. So yeah. uh, somebody going at your horse is extremely uh, effective. Big problem Sorry, for you. I was yeah. away from, uh, thank you, thank you for clearing that. Bruce, I really appreciate your input on that. Thank you. Oh, sorry, BD, were you saying something? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, I apologize for breaking in. Uh, which player are we on? I was just I just stepped away and I'm confused as to where we are. We're we're on 42 um, uh, verso C and D we're now. We're starting the 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 horse section now, and uh... <laughs> yeah, you want to give us this one, uh, Kel? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. This is another counter of the Lanskin sword. The one with the lance steadies his weapon under his left arm to prevent his lance from being beaten aside. This enables him to strike the swordsman with his lance. And you know, the funny you thing much. is, even if you don't have horses, when you do this one on foot and wasp briskly past each other, the guy can try and cover you with a really hard Mazzano or Satani. He can't set it aside. It's amazing. It is such a stable position, even on foot, let alone on horseback. With the, with the inertia of the horse, it's amazing. It's pretty amazing. I have used this in a test and knocked the entire target structure, including the base, and knocked it over. <laughs> awesome. So can, can you guys uh, explain what's awesome. actually going on here? Because I'm not yeah, sure. So, uh, so, Alex, See, what's, what's going on? What's... Okay, Bruce so what it. happened oh. is we've seen <clears> before <throat> he tucks the lance under his right, right arm and holds it in his right hand. What he has done here is he has brought the butt of the lance across to the left-hand side and tucked it under his left arm. So it is still in his right hand, but under his left arm. This makes it, it's at a, at a harsher angle, but it's a far more stable position for striking something, another person, especially on horseback. In fact, I, I would say that if he did sweep against this the the uh, zugador here, he might knock him out of the saddle. Yeah, but basically, the, it's it's getting a grip that will make it hard for the sword to counter or to correct. Uh, it, okay, correct. Uh, another way to explain it, if I may, is it stabilizes the rear of the lance, the uh, the part behind the fulcrum, which is the right hand. Uh, it stabilizes the rear of the lance across the torso instead of under simply one arm. So it puts it across the torso and under one arm and therefore stabilizes the point to an extent that is impossible to set aside with a sword in one hand. 
you literally cannot hit it hard enough with a sword in one hand to divert it from its path. Does that make well, it more clear? This sounds awesome. Why don't you always do this? Why would you? Well, because <laughs> you have you have very limited opportunities from this position. You can hit only one target, and um, and it only works against a sword in one hand. So if you try this against the lance, yeah, the lance is simply going to go around you, and because and your lance yeah. has lost its agility. And just because, Alex, the, the this particular technique makes it difficult, if not impossible, to set aside, it doesn't mean that the land strike is going to be true. And it also doesn't mean that there isn't other things that the, that the uh, horseman can do. So Yeah, the, guy, is, with, the uh, guy with the sword is, can... Go ahead, Bruce. It is very hard to aim the tip of the lance into a target using this technique. Oh, no. Whereas, typically, under the arm... Is it is much much easier with a little bit of training? Actually, not much. Surprisingly, not much training. It becomes very easy to hit uh, on target and hit a say a small ring. If you make an OK sign with your hand right now, a ring that size, you can easily hit it. I can easily hit it with a little bit of practice from with my sword under the right hand. When I put the sword under my left hand it becomes very hard to hit even a large target true. But it is very easy to sweep side to side with that lance. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. The, I think the, the big difference here in my personal practice with just riding around with a lance, I've never you know actually hit anything other than rings with a lance. Um, putting it under the left arm in the, uh, the one circumstance that I actually tried it out of curiosity because someone said, hey, try this. And it was before I, I you know, got involved in Emma. So they said, hey, try this. This is in an old book. And I said, okay. And I couldn't hit the freaking ring. I could not hit the ring because I didn't have enough fine motor control. The motor control comes from the combination of your arm and hand. Whereas when you've got a cross braced across your chest, you lose a lot of that mobility. You lose a lot of that um, dexterity, as it were. Um, <clears throat> and it's the same thing with the sword. I'm pretty handy with a sword, and I have been for many decades. Um, it's it's very easy for me to do anything I want to do, whether it's on foot or on a horse, because they're really no different. It's a sword. But with a lance on foot, you can do all sorts of things when it's on your right side. But when you put it on the opposite side, it becomes a crippling device that is very strong, but doesn't have much dexterity is the best way to describe it. And that's really more about the fine motor control of your hand and arm and elbow than it is about uh, the power that's transferred through your torso and the horse. Because the whole, the whole point of you know, being on horseback with a lance is to focus the energy of both of you and your inertia onto the point of the lance. Well, if you cross your body, you lose the ability to focus that accurately, but it's very, very stable. So it can't be set aside easily with a one-handed weapon. If another lance struck it, it might set it aside, maybe depends on how good whether they'd be able to hit you afterward is also questionable uh, as people that bash with lances quickly find out that their point is almost always offline after they smash something um, on horseback you've got even that that much more inertia going so if you hit something sure you're going to hit it hard but you may not be able to control where it goes uh, to me this this particular technique is such a common sense uh, physiological solution to a problem that it's surprising that it wasn't um, shown in any other uh, treatise at the time. I doubt that Fiore invented this by himself. I think that he saw some really, really good writers uh, do this in his younger days and he just went, well, that works. Uh, 
because that's an awful lot of what Fiore talks about. He traveled all over, he learned from various masters, and he sucked up what was good. And, you know, like anybody that's a Bruce Lee fan, uh, and I'm much less of one than I used to be, but he still said something useful. Absorb what is good, cast away what is useless. You know, Fiore's there. 600 years all right. before. And so as we approach the um, the end of our evening, we're going to do two more plays. And this will cap off um, the first part of our introduction to the mounted section, where we've seen uh, Fiore defend um, and counter lance against lance and then sword against lance. So we have two more plays of the sword against the lance. And these are on folio 43R. And I will read these ones. So fully three, uh, folio forty three R uh, A and B. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Greg. Mm -hmm. Of the play that we just did, um, mm -hmm. one final question. Hopefully, it's a quick answer. Mm -hmm. uh, is he thrusting on the left or the right side of the horse? Like, like is is his opponent going to be on the left side or the right side? He's thrusting on the right because it's virtually impossible on to the right. lance over yeah. the left hand side. I think it's right. on the right. Yeah. Yeah. That. It's across, it's across okay. his body. It's across his body. Okay. When you look at these plates in the equestrian section, it's very clear whether they have um, extraordinary protection on their left side, the riders, or whether they don't. And where they don't, they pass weapon to weapon. And where they do, they pass shield to shield or armor to armor. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. So, good 40, question. yeah, it's a great really question. good question. Forty-three R, A, and B. Um, so, the first play: this swordsman waits for the lance in Denti di Cincaro. As the opponent with the lance approaches him, the master beats the lance aside to the right. The master can easily do this action with his sword, that is, parrying and striking with a single turn of the sword. Oh, wow, so that is this play right here. Okay. And then uh, last, uh, lastly, I'll just read this one as well. We have the counter to Dentity Cincaro with a sword, which is the uh, lance stabbing the horse in the face. <laughs> and this reads, the horse more than being hit in the eye. Yep, I can't imagine. This is the counter to the play of the lance and the sword we just saw. The man with the lance strikes the opponent's horse in the head, and the swordsman cannot parry since the attack comes too low. So uh, here again, the last comments that I really have to say are, are, are just this, that we started this today by saying, you know, the, the mounted section, or I, I suggested rather, that the mounted section contains in sort of equal measure things that most of us have no idea about and things that we have every idea about. And so with respect to the equestrian uh, foundation of this section. Obviously, those of us who don't have a lot of equestrian experience uh, need to rely on um, a whole bunch of other sources of information in order to give ourselves a clue. Um, on the other hand, the martial actions that are going on in these plays um, seem relatively straightforward to those who have been following the logic of uh, Fiori's plays thus far. So these two it, are simply plays of measure. Exactly, right? In this first one here, we're just doing an exchange of point with the sword and Dente teaching Garo, all of which we understand already, uh, concepts-wise, right? It's just, of course, we're doing it on horseback. And here, um, well, we're seeing something which we've seen already in the section. In order to counter the threat of the, of the parry, rather than, at least in this particular case, rather than trying and doing something clever like cavitating or whatever something that we might do with the sword fiori just says fuck it and stabs the force in the face <laughs> which is a completely and, and reasonable fun, thing right the, the funny thing is to me um you know you see movies like uh, blazing saddles where alex Karras punches the the horse and knocks it out type of thing um i don't think that's a very uh, reasonable uh, the solution knocking down a horse with a punch takes what you can only call heroic strength. But if you poke a horse in the face, I'm not talking about like the, the nose or whatever. If you jab it under the eye, you jab it at the ears, that horse is going to flinch and move. Even if it's extremely well-trained, 
unless it has some armor like a chamfron on its face, that horse is not going to put up with having something jabbed into it. And so the confusion that's caused uh, to your horse will disrupt the ability of uh, the Zugadori in this case to actually manifest any sort of cover. So you could jab the horse in the face and then plant it in the face of the Zug right after. Right. right? Since you've taken a you've taken basically a, pu- a pool cue shot at the horse's face, whether you actually blind it or not, uh, is going to make the horse mm-hmm. turn to its right. It's not going to turn into the injury. It's going to turn away from the injury, which makes the sword very very difficult to make a cover. It's now got that much less lance to counter. So trying to strike the first third of the lance is going to turn into trying trying to strike the last tenth of the lance. Whereas you with the lance extended forward like this over your horse, so you've taken this long, low shot, which is the equivalent of a leg shot with a spear. If you pull this, poke the horse in the face, and then pull the thing back and slam another one high at the rider, especially since he has no headgear, you're going to do well. It's a really efficient tactic. And personally, I've never done this, but logically from, you know, handling horses the, to the extent that I have, horses don't like shit in their face. They don't want your hand by their eyes. They like to have a scratch behind the ear, under the chin, and all that kind of stuff, stroke down the neck. But the last thing a horse wants you to do is get near its eye. So it's it's a pretty logical sort of uh, mm-hmm. counter. Bruce, got any comment on that? Yeah, a frightened, upset horse. That rider with the sword is going to be spending most of his effort staying on a horse that is going to be rearing and kicking and bucking and just losing it. He's not going to be doing any fighting. It's the same yeah. thing with the play that we had before, several several pages back, where the person bashes him over the head with the pommel And that person now has a concussion and he's losing it and he just wants to get away. That that same play earlier, this is the same thing. You have taken away any possibility of that rider focusing on anything other than staying in the saddle and trying to stay on the horse. Or that horse may lose it and take off. I'm glad you agree. Good. Bolting, it's going. So he's no, that rider with the sword is no longer a threat. Yeah. Even, even a really well-trained horse with head protection is going to react poorly to being smashed in the face with a spear. Even if it doesn't physically uh, injure the horse, the horse is going to go, I don't like this crap. How well-trained the horse is. Just, just cannot no. train that out of a horse. You can't train a horse out of that and he's poking him in the eye threatening him hit it, cutting him a horse gets cut in the head even even the nose the muzzle anything else that horse is going to be reacting to pain not listening to the yeah. Ride. Yeah, they're not gonna they're not gonna follow commands at all and and um a good example of that oddly enough if people say well how do you know that well as five different people that were involved in the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, three of them French, one of them English, and one of them Belgian, all wrote about the confusion caused to the horses when they were showered with arrows by the archers they were supposed to overcome. The horses literally turned and wildly charged through a long stream of armored and armed men standing shoulder to shoulder. The horses just careened through them. All five of the sources that are mentioned in um, in Anne Curry. Curry, thank you. And Curry. Curry's uh, sources uh, interpretations for the Hundred Year War at mm-hmm. uh, All of them say the same thing. The uh, the little squadrons that were supposed to be set up to charge the archers on either side of the field and uh, were hastily scattered because these guys 
these guys were all proud, you know, warming up their horses for the charge when it actually happened. So maybe 10 or 20 percent of them actually charged the archer positions with stakes in front of the archers and the archers literally ripped them to pieces. There were only two or three that made it to the stakes. Their horses were killed and then the uh, archers went out and, and killed the, the riders afterwards. Um, the simple fact is the horse is not going to put up with being hurt. The horse will do heroic things until it's no longer a hero because it believes it can do it like this there's some business that i've never seen the actual detail of it but i've heard it so many times about uh normans teaching their horses to run over infantry they would set up straw men uh, in a field and the straw men would have kind of baskets with dirt and stuff on the bottom so they were sort of like weebles that wobble when you can't fall down and they just run the horses through them over and over again until the horses went, well, this is a fun game. I can do it. You know, didn't care. And Norman horses were not guarded. They were just, like, they had a saddle on them. That was it. That was the only protection they had. So getting the horse to charge into somebody is very difficult, as any modern police equestrian unit will tell you. They have to work really hard to get the horse to do anything more than shoulder protesters apart. Um, they can ride through them at a trot, but horses will not charge into a solid wall, period. So if, if the, you know, like, like the people that, that held the, the Maidan Square in Ukraine in 2014 with the riot shields that were improvised, the, the Russians didn't put horses up against them because they knew they didn't want to work. They sent in infantry. Whereas in other cases where there were no big lines of people, they sent in police horses and army horses to chase down the stragglers and beat them and knock them down and stuff like that and arrest them. And they had infantry to follow to do the arresting. Horses are, are amazing creatures, but they're not particularly courageous creatures. Individuals might do something courageous uh, because of their own personality and of course, Western uh, Western Europeans in the Middle Ages almost ex exclusively rolled stallions into battle, which amazed amazed the other uh, people they ran into, especially from the Crusades on. Arabs were known for riding mares because they were controllable and they were herd animals and they'd stay together. Whereas stallions tended to fight each other as much as anything they were thrown against. So coaxing them forward into the charge was something that was a relief to a lot of stallions because standing around with a lot of other stallions and smelling each other's pheromones made them just psychotic. This is something that I read in uh, English writer. She wrote two books for HMSO books. Okay can't remember what her name is, but she wrote one about the equipment of the medieval horse and one about the equipment of the uh, Renaissance horse. And it's based on digs of uh, horses' bodies from all over different uh, horses' uh, skeletons from all over different uh, parts of Europe where uh, they would measure the size of the horse or whatever. It was one of the big things that was dispelled was the, the gigantic draw you know, draft horse, sort of Clydesdale charger. They simply weren't invented until the age of steam because they didn't have to haul anything so big as a steam engine until then. And they were bred specifically for that purpose in the 17th, late 17th, 18th or century when steam was a, a new, or 19th century when the new, the steam was a new thing. The horses that medieval people were riding were gigantically powerful horses, but they weren't even as large as the modern police horse today. Modern police horse is more of a, a race horse than than a war horse. The, the closest thing. Well, no, would... uh, sorry, sorry. Let me just finish. The last, the, the 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 last breed that can still be compared to a common medieval war horse is the Morgan because it has really huge haunches and very very uh, subtle footwork. It's a, it's a very classic and agile horse with a lot of thrusting power and oddly enough morgans are more often known for hunting 
than anything else. And what was the typical medieval hunter? Uh, a horse, when you see pictures of uh, the various hunting horses, really look a lot like the modern Morgan, whereas thoroughbreds, totally different critter. Big, long, lanky things. Um, the bones aren't nearly as heavy. Their, their musculature isn't nearly as heavy. They're built more for speed than for endurance and for power. Um, and you look at a Clydesdale or a Percheron or any other modern uh, draft horse, it's their, their four parts that are huge and powerful to push against the collar, to draw weight. Um, those horses didn't exist and there was no need for them until the age of steam. Anyways, Bruce, please. Again, what um, what I was going to say is when I uh, uh, did a tour of European museums in, in 2017, one of the points I made of asking, and I asked at the Leeds Armory, and I asked at the uh, uh, Wallace Collection in London, and I asked at the French Museum in, uh, in Paris, amongst others, was how big the barding of the horses were, and I looked at the models that they used to display the items. And in every case, those horses were uh, 15, uh, 15 to 16 hands high, no more than that. At the most. And for, yeah. refer for reference, a, a quote hand is four inches. So we're talking 15 times four, which is about five feet at most. Yeah. yeah. So a um, Andrew, a Andrew Ayton's book goes into this in great detail. Right. They had. They, they were they were heavy set horses, but they were not big horses. In fact, your typical riding horse today, if you went to go riding, would be about a good uh, hand high hand your your hands width higher taller than the typical large medieval war horse. So but, all those but scenes not as heavily built. Much, yeah. not so, heavily so all those built. scenes in movies. And uh, medieval times and places where they're using like great big um, horses, those are all modern breeds. Draft horses, yeah. That's the yeah. point I was getting. Draft to. horses. The, 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 the idea of the Clydesdale, uh, the, you know, the Clydesdale, the Percheron, those horses are so expensive to feed and to house uh, because they're so gigantic that. Um, they're not practical for any sort of uh, use other than as heavy draft, heavy drawing animals that an, a modern tractor now does. When you look at uh, agriculture in England in the uh, pre-First World War era, the vast majority of, of farms were still horse-powered, uh, as it were. You know, like they use the horses for everything from threshing to to uh, plowing to uh, drawing hay wagons. You know, they were they were the beast that provided the energy to move stuff around. Um, and in the First World War, of course, those same horses were heavily used to move artillery pieces and that sort of thing. And even into the Second World War, um, the Belgian... The Belgian heavy horse uh, is a good example of what might have been a much later version of a medieval heavy horse, like heavy cavalry in the 16th century, because they're designed to not only be ridden, they had, they had saddles for them, but they're also designed to wear collars and draw, so they have the big heavy neck and, and shoulders of a typical draft horse, but they also had the powerful hindquarters that a lot of uh, modern draft horses like the Clydesdale and the Percheron no longer have. They're very, very tall, but their ability to carry weight is no more than a horse that's much smaller. For example, their spine is not capable of carrying the weight of a fully mounted man and equipment and barding. It's really too hard on their back because their muscles are and their shoulders and, and skeleton are all designed for forward motion right or occasionally for backward motion like um, you know pulling logs in a forest or, or that kind of thing but uh, the type of horse that uh, for example tim severin 
in his book Crusader. He did an experimental archaeological uh, study of riding a horse from basically central Germany to the Holy Land as a crusader would. And he got uh, a couple of different horses. He got a donkey or a mule or whatever to carry the, the luggage. And, and, and he had a, a female friend go along as a squire. And she rode the um, either the donkey or whatever the secondary animal was, mule. Uh, and, or she rode the the Rouncy, the, the normal horse for riding uh, when, when he was on the... Uh, the Belgian, and he got in a saddle from the uh, German Army Museum and had a, uh, a replica of it built in Ireland by a leather worker. So anyways, he rode this stuff and he took and, and mounted the horse. But he said riding the the uh, Belgian, it's like riding a, a tractor with square wheels. 